It's the Bob Cowan Podcast featuring John Shannon. Hello, Robert. Hello, John. You're very did, you, uh, did you dig out? Did you dig out? Are you okay? Oh, I have people for all that. Not to worry. <laughs> I always worry. I always worry. You know that. Oh. There's a little snow under where the car was, but the rest of the driveway is um, is cleared Beautiful. off and they put salt down so it's dry and um, oh. we're ready to move on. Okay. All right. um, and in, a, a really intriguing um, guest for everybody uh, today. Uh, the name Mike Milbury should not be um, unfamiliar to anybody who's a hockey fan, whether um, his tenure as a player, as a coach, as a general manager, and for the past, I don't know, long time as a broadcaster. And Mike Milbury was uh, let go by NBC uh, last year. And he will join us to talk about that and a bunch of other stuff. Mike Milbury, when we come back after these messages. Hey, it's McCowan and Shannon back on the uh, program for this. Um, what day is it, John? Tuesday? It is a Tuesday. It's the day after. Uh, the day after the big snowfall. The wor- John says the worst in history of mankind in, uh, in Toronto. But um, Pretty darn bad, so sure. Bob. I'm not it's so pretty sure. Pretty darn bad. Yeah, well, there's a lot of snow. We'll give you You're that. a lot older than me. You would remember a lot more years. Screw you. <laughs> uh, he was the uh, a player for the Boston Bruins for um, 12 years, assistant uh, general manager, head coach of the Bruins, GM coach of the Islanders, NHL commentator for NBC, and for Hockey Night in Canada, Mike Milbury is uh, with us. You look good. You look healthy. How are you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, f- I'm really fine. I'm still... Uh... You know, I, I miss working daily. I do a podcast a couple of days a week, and I I, uh, I do a radio show for WEI here in Boston uh, one day a week. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm about to turn 70, but I just feel like I, I got to find, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to the supermarket, I think, and become a clerk because <laughs> I, I got to do something. I can't, I, you know, it's not golf season here. I'm living on Cape Cod, and, and I, I just started to play golf. At my age, uh-huh. it was a bit of a challenge, but I, I've really started to enjoy it. And then the winter came and that, that goes on hold. So anyway, I'm doing fine. Thanks. Oh, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Milbury on a golf course. That, I, 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 weren't there state laws put in place that, you know, Milbury <laughs> should never be on a golf course? You know, it, uh, time changes all men. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, I, I play with my two, my youngest sons, uh, 22 and 21, and they get all frustrated with a bad shot, right? They can hit the ball a country mile. I mean, they, they just crush it. And I, you know, I just step up. I go to the, the you know, the senior tee. And I don't care if I'm a little, like 15 yards ahead of them. And I just like take my time. And if I, if I just dub it into the grass, then I hit it again. And I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't get bothered, but they get all pissed off and fussy. And, you know, I mean, I've really been, time has has sort of softened the edges of my my curmudgeonly like behavior john well um i think we i'm all, not so sure mike <laughs> well, we all get a little mellower with age and i think the golf course is one place where it demonstrates itself you know at, at one point i'm sure milbury you would have been snapping clubs and yelling and screaming and kicking at the dirt I went through that when I was younger and now yeah, I just go out and have, uh, have a few laughs, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Have a chat with the boys, find out how their lives are going or, you know, with a, make a new friend. And, you know, there are lots of really shitty golfers out there. So you can find, you can find your level to play with. That's for sure. <laughs> Why are you looking at me when you say that? that's what I want to know? <laughs> well, um, I don't know where we should start with this. Oh, no, we have to start. We have to start with the obvious. We well, have to start with uh, Mike's life in the bubble in Toronto and, uh, and what happened when uh, Mike made a comment on NBC about uh, no distractions in the bubble for the players. And next thing you know, he got sent home. Right, Mike? That's right. I mean, I'll, I'll tee it up with not, not intending to go the golf route again, but I'll tee it up by saying that I, I you know, I was what, 66, 65, 65 when Sam Flood come, came to me and asked me to start doing some in-game analysis. And I, I didn't know why. I thought I was doing fine in the studio, but he wanted to change it up. And so he changed it up. And then when the bubble, the pandemic occurred, 
Um, a lot of our analysts were a little bit squishy about going to the bubble. So they came to me and asked me if I would go to the bubble. And, you know, to be honest with you, I had just come off, off a boat with, with uh, kidney cancer a year earlier, a year and a half earlier. I uh, had major surgery on it. And, you know, but, I, you know, I was fine. And uh, I said, OK, fine, I'll go. Uh, I went to the bubble, spent the first five days in my room. I mean, literally in my room. You couldn't leave. You couldn't go out the door. You could open the door to leave your, your dirty dishes out there for room service to come and get it. And then I, we started doing two games a day most of the time. And then we just kept on plowing through it. And um, on this particular occasion, the last day of my NBC broadcasting career, Brian Boucher brought up the topic of like, there's no fans here, there's nothing here, but it, it's a could could be perceived as a really good place to focus on hockey. And and he went on for a bit about that. And so it was an impromptu comment by him. And I certainly hadn't thought about my reaction to it, but I said, yeah, I mean, you could look at this as an ideal place. It's just the players hanging out together, kind of like a training camp situation. They're not even any women here to distract him. And that, that was the end of the comment. I didn't really think anything of it. The following morning, I received a call from Sam Flood who said, well, your comments last night are, are attracting attention. And I had to have him clarify what comments they were because I really, I, you know, I've been offensive before. I know, and I know when I'm really being offensive, but uh, he said the one about women being a, a distraction. And I said, well, all right, well, he, he said, well, I'll keep you posted. Call me back and said, we need to issue an apology. And I said, at that point, I said, you know, and I've done this before. He, he had come to me before when I'd criticized Crosby or Ovechkin and their, their owners of those uh, prospective uh, franchises would call uh, Batman. Batman would call Sam Flood and Sam Flood would say, you know, you got to back off or you got to apologize. And then I said what I said on this occasion, just just write whatever you want to NBC. I said, just write the PR staff. I said, write whatever you want and let's just get past it. Cause that, I thought that's all it was going to take. Well, they did. And uh, I didn't even look at it. I didn't read it and still haven't read it. And, uh, and then uh, the NHL came out with a statement uh, and they, they condemned my statements as non-inclusive and whatever Elver, other crap they used to describe the statement. And then I got a call from Sam Flood and said, we're, we're not going to use you for the rest of this season. But in a week or two, when this is all over, we'll call you back and we'll talk about your schedule for next year. So I went home. And I was I was not happy. And I, I was really uh, confused as well because I didn't think this was a, a major gaffe. And uh, I got home, spent a couple of weeks at home, and then I got a call from Sam Flood uh, and he said, we're not inviting you back for next year. And I said, well, what, what does that do to my contract? And he said, well, we're going to pay you the rest of your contract. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, okay, fine. Uh, and I, I said, is this, was this really that bad? And he said, well, people here and people at the league have looked at it as a, as a particularly misogynistic comment. And uh, we can't go down that path. So I said nothing, did nothing for, for the rest of the term of my contract because I didn't want to jeopardize being paid. But when it was over, uh, I made a call to Sam Flood and I said, Sam, what happened here? And he said, well, you know, it was not only this comment, but other comments and we just can't go down that path anymore. It's a new day and age. And then I called Gary Bettman and I said, Gary, uh, first of all, he, he didn't answer the phone. And then I, he, he called me back about a week later at, on his terms and his staff had made a comment later that, that I, when I called him, which I didn't do, he called me back that he was uh, under duress because it was before the Stanley cup final. But what he said to cover his tracks was when I asked him the question, was this really so bad? What I said, did you really find it so offensive? And he said to me, Mike, I don't even remember what you said. I'm 46 years in the freaking business and working as the lead analyst for CBC and then the NBC and had been a manager and a player and a coach 
And he's and his officials have dismissed me after 46 years for this comment. And he can't remember what it was. That really pissed me off. And at that point, I uh, picked up the phone and called, called Dan Shaughnessy from the Globe and just had him asked him to interview me for my piece and sort of let it let it rest and he did a nice article it was a big piece in the Sunday Globe a few months ago and I had my say with it I got it off my chest and now I got to move on am I resentful and pissed off still yes uh, I didn't think it was fair and let me ask you did you think it was fair well look let me, let me throw my two cents in here first because you and I don't know each other um uh, um, have barely chatted over the years and um i i'm not sucking up to you but when i saw the comment i was as stunned i think as you were um i've gotten in trouble for things i've said in in the past as john will attest and probably will again in the future and i know that you said a bunch of controversial things um but this was nothing this was as meek and mild and and as you know off the top of your head as you can possibly get. And I think you understand, Mike, that this was not the National Hockey League or NBC or any broadcast entity that brought this down on you. It was outside influences. Somebody wrote something or said something or uh, 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 quoted you. And the politically correct world went to town on you. And it was that pressure that caused Batman and NBC to fold up like a cheap suit. So um, I think you know that, don't you? There was a woman from The Athletic in Washington, D.C. that wrote a piece. And there was somebody else. I, I, I only saw that piece in The Athletic well after the fact. Uh, but I can't believe... What I can't believe is that people can have such little fortitude that, that a comment from somebody outside of their sphere of influence mm -hmm. can make that big a difference. And that, but that's where we are. In the social media world, people make comments and all of a sudden they get carried to all parts of the globe and they, and they change people's lives. And I guess that's what happened. But I, I just... I'm really disappointed in NBC. I'm disappointed in, in the National Hockey League. And I felt I deserved better after almost five decades in the, in the business. Well, I got, I got an idea here, John. Let me, let me finish this. So, yeah. Shannon, you were you know, a senior executive um, in hockey broadcasting, both Canada and the United States, and you worked at the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. What would you have done if you were in the truck when Milbury said what he said, what would well, your response have been? At the time, I don't think we would have noticed. That's the first thing. Uh, and I'm not sure they did notice at the time when Mike said it. Um, uh, you, you know, I, th I think that the, the, the reality of it is now is that Mike became an easy target, not for this one, but for, you know, always broadcasting on the edge, Mike. And, 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 but you were hired to broadcast on the edge. That was part of your MO. I want to listen to Mike Milbury because I want to hear Mike Milbury have not outlandish comments, but, you know, honest comments, straightforward comments. Uh, that's why you were, you were part of the, that key group. You were paid to be that blunt. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think that uh, I think that loyalty factor you bring up, I think, is one that's very disappointing. That's the part that's the part that I think it, it, maybe it's our age, but loyalty is a very important part of every everyday life for us. And for to, for the loyalty not to have been reciprocated to me is very disappointing. Well, what was the appropriate response? Sorry, Mike, but what, what was would your response have been if you were in a if you were in the truck and you were in a position of power? Would you have disciplined Mike in any way? Well, it's, as it's I different, wouldn't. you know. Well, I, as I said, I wouldn't have even noticed it. But the but the uh, the kickback the next day and the day after, I think that uh, I think the issue of an apology 
if that was what was needed, issue the apology and then move on. You know, if that means Mike goes home for a week and then comes back, that's what probably that probably would have been the issue. The problem becomes, and I'm not making excuses. I'm just the goalposts have moved so far left. Uh, when you think about the corporate entity that NBC is owned by Comcast, what are the Comcast rules? Uh, you, you know, I think the NHL has become much more uh, open to uh, to to uh, diversity and and these types of things, and they're trying to figure out their own way. I don't know. I mean, I would not have done anything more than say, "Hey, Mike, let's apologize and move on. Let's apologize and move on, and you're still a valuable member of our team." That's what which, well, that's what should have happened. Milbury, your thoughts now. I... I'm taking it, back my apology from NBC that was written for, from somebody else. I'm taking it back. I stand by my comments. Yeah. All through my life, women, because I'm a heterosexual male, have been somewhat of a distraction to me. Uh, and, and, and if you look at it through the mediums of television and, and social media, uh, there's a real attempt by many women to be a distraction, to be an attraction for me. And, and, when women aren't around, and that's why, you know, when teams play in the playoffs, they're at home, but they ask their team to come and check into the hotel. It's because right. they don't want them to be around any distractions that are their wives or girlfriends or dogs or children or, or anything else or, or the mailman coming and they've got bills to pay. They, they, they want them away from all of those things that might be somewhat distracting to their focus on on what is the most important part of the life at the time which is the upcoming game so i take well, back my apology from nbc that was issued by nbc and i stand by my comments yeah, so it, but here, here 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 but here's my here's my point about about the apology uh, thing is if there's enough i mean let's face it we're 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 you know when you're dealing with a, an audience of two or three million people uh and if there's enough feedback that somebody says, hey, I'm ticked off and I'm embarrassed or I'm upset with something somebody said, then there has to be some level of consideration to discuss it. That's my point about the apology. Because And the apology should be, there was no intent. The distractions are distractions. And if I insulted anybody with my comments, I apologize. You know, That's you all. say two to three million people but as far as I know, there were like two or three people, not millions, but, two but or that's three what, people. That's but, what but, the, that, that, that's what the corporate entity NBC has to, and the NHL have to measure. That's what they have to measure. Not you, not me, but that's what those people in, 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 you know, in the corner offices, yeah. wearing the suits, they have to measure that. I'm going to tell you, John, that since that incident occurred, I have had, I mean, no, not many people are going to come up to me and start saying, geez, you, you really deserve to be fired. But to the contrary, almost on a, when it first started, almost a daily basis, and now still even a weekly or bi-weekly basis, I get people that come up to me and say, I, I can't believe what happened to you. I can't, I can't believe that that happened to you. And, and, I, and it was, it's been gratifying. Um, and I think they're genuine. I mean, that's it. They've come up to me more on this topic than any other thing that I've ever done or accomplished or said in my life. And it's been, it's, I, I really think it was been a point of pride for me that these people have come up and made it a, a concerted effort, whether it was in the grocery store, walking down the street or whatever I might've been. Um, there's been so many of them and I, and I, I thank them again for their comments. Mm. Well, uh, add me to the list of, uh, of people that are uh, pissed off on your behalf because uh, this was really nothing. And the only thing I can tell you is um, in the middle of my broadcast career, I had a, um, a very highly respected guy that I worked for that um, John knows very well uh, as the program director and my superior. And he, uh, and I don't remember there was a, if I think there was an incident, I said something and, and, you know, now we're trying to figure out what, what the response should be. And his, his words to me were, you know, we pay you to be you. It is my job right. 
to defend you and to protect you. And, um, and he always did. And I think in this case, and I know it's no satisfaction for you, Mike, but you weren't protected. There wasn't somebody there to stand up for you and say, wait a second, we're going way too far with this over um, a humorous and unspecific comment. I think you would acknowledge if you'd gone a lot further with that thought process on the air, there may have been grounds, but you didn't. It was a relatively innocuous statement and, and, and a truism that everybody around sport, forget hockey alone, everybody around sport understands. So, um, look, I know it's no satisfaction, but um, I applaud you for the stance that you took. And I applaud you for the fact that you withdrew your, um, well, the apology that NBC uh, created for you. Yeah. Now, I'm just curious, Mike, that, uh, with uh, the change in, uh, in uh, rights in the United States to ESPN and Turner, did you get, any overtures from either of those networks? To, you know, I, to I hired a, I, I mostly, I had, you know, I got to NBC after I left the Islanders and they had came to me almost immediately and asked me if I was interested. And so I didn't really need an agent. Uh, but at this juncture, I felt I needed one. So I hired an agent. He called TNT. They said, no, thank you. Immediately. Didn't even get a sniff. Called ESPN. No, thank you. Not even a sniff. It was just, it was, I, I, I firmly believe that there were people from the league that influenced them in that decision. It was not, I mean, I had been the, the lead studio analyst along with Keith Jones for a long time for NBC and, and I think was still capable of doing a good job. And these two knew, and I'd all, I already worked for ESPN, by the way. I'd worked for ESPN way back when and for a year. Uh, but in both cases, they just said, no, we're going in a different direction. Now, were they worried about the backlash of the lefty liberals that would be upset because of my hiring? Or was it an outside influence from the league perspective? I, I will never know. But I, I believe that there were, it wasn't just them saying to me that I, I was a shitty broadcaster. I think they were basically bending to other influences, whether it was the, the league or social, social pressures. I, I'll never know. So, you know, you, you claim you are, and I'm sure you are um, essentially unapologetic about what you said. Has it though influenced you in the things that you've done in the months since then? You mentioned, you know, the, the few broadcast things that you're doing now in the podcast. Are you a little, are, are you any more careful? Are you a, more thoughtful before you speak? I thought I was more careful at that time. I mean, there were times in the past where I had said things that if I had said them in 2019, they definitely would have got me in trouble or, or dismissed. But I, 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 I'm not blind. I'm not stupid. I, I saw the winds of change. I read the tea leaves. I, I thought I was being more careful. I didn't think this crossed a line. I, I, I really didn't. If, if, it, if I had thought about it crossing a line, I, I would have backed off because I realized at that time the, the temperature was rising in terms of the woke movement. And uh you know, I liked my job. I liked what I was doing. I wanted to keep on doing it. I liked the paycheck. Mm -hmm. I missed the paycheck. Um, but I thought I had made some, I diverted some of my comments and, and, and made them milder than I might have otherwise in a different era, but obviously not enough. Mike Milbury is with us. We'll, um, we'll put that topic aside, I think, for the moment. Uh, take a quick break and uh, talk about some other things when we continue after these messages. Bob McCown, John Shannon, Mike Milbury uh, joining us uh, today. John, take us in another direction, if you will. <laughs> so uh, our producer, uh, Hugh McClarty, was uh, doing a bit of research before the show started, and he says, Milbury was that guy at Madison Square Garden with the shoe in the crowd. And I said, oh, yeah, he and Peter McNabb were part of that group that went in. So... Um, <laughs> how many games would you have got did you get suspended for that 
Oh yeah, I got suspended for six games. Um, and if you in 2022, how many would you got? I would probably life. I mean, it was certainly a year, um, but but maybe even more than that. You know, it's funny. Remember Ron Artest from the Pistons got in trouble. Yeah, sure. uh, Malice he wound, the Palace. He, yeah. <laughs> he got, what did he get suspended for? Like half a season or a season or yeah. something ridiculous. And he said, some white guy goes into the stands in Madison Square Garden, hits a guy with a shoe. He gets six games. I go in and hit a guy who's thrown a beer at me and I get a lifetime suspension. <laughs> Where's the fairness in that? But anyway, I'll, I'll tell you the story. We're, we're in Madison Square Garden. It's December 23rd, 1979. It's two days before Christmas. Playing the Rangers. Espo has, you know, recently been traded from the Bruins. And it's a big, kind of a big rivalry uh, and a good game. And we are holding a one goal lead with just seconds to go, like 10 seconds to go in the game. And Espo gets a breakaway. And for whatever reason, this fan threw a tennis ball in front of him as he's on the break, right in front of him. And he claims that he would have scored if it, the tennis ball wasn't thrown, but that's neither here nor there. He goes in on Cheevers and cheese, cheesy stones. Him. So uh, the horn blows and I jump over the boards to yeah, all rush to the goaltender for whatever reason to, to celebrate. And, but I don't linger. Because at that time, you were likely to be the target of irate fans in Madison Square Garden who would throw cigarette lighters or full beer cans or bottles and or whatever whatever else they might have put their hands on. And I was aware of that. And I went, I patted Cheesy on the head and went directly to the locker room. Had got to the locker room and and there was no followers. I was the first guy there and there was nobody coming behind me. Finally, Cheevers enters the room. Um, and I said, Jerry, where is everybody? And he said, well, there's some sort of beef going on out there. So and while I was walking a fairly long distance to the locker room, uh, Al Secord had gone to the other end of the ice or in crisscrossing with the Ranger team had kicked out the skates of Ofnan Nielsen, you know, and John Davidson saw it got really upset and came running down to the uh, Bruins side of the ice where the two teams started to mingle, looked like there was going to be a, a full, full on ice brawl between two teams that were all, all of them were on the ice. When uh, Stan Jonathan sort of moved over towards the glass, a fan reached over, grabbed a stick out of his hands and then started menacing the stick at towards Jonathan and then O'Reilly and O'Reilly crazy son of a bitch that he was, immediately took offense because the fan was being, you know, aggressive. He, and I only know this because I saw it on videotape later. I mean, I'm still in the locker room. He climbs the stands. And when your captain climbs the stands, that, that's a call to arms. Everybody's got to go into the stands or almost everybody. So maybe six, seven, eight players jump into the stands uh, in, in pursuit of O'Reilly and his attackers. And it's at this point, when they're already in the stands, McNabb about 10 rows up, that I enter the, the, the ice surface area and I don't climb the glass. I just walk in my skates. I got no, no helmet, no gloves, no stick. Uh, I've been in the locker room for a while and I've been staring at the ice cold Budweiser waiting to open one. And, and I run back and, and I, I run up the stairs. I have no idea what has happened. I have no idea of the, the circumstances and I see Peter McNabb and he's sort of alone 10, 12, 15 rows, whatever it was up in the stands. And he's got a fan uh, sort of upside down. His, the, the fans back is over a chair and his feet are up in the air, but I, I you know, he's alone. So, you know, I, team player, I want to go up there and help out. I walk up the stairs and it was, I have to tell you, you know, I get a little excited thinking about this even today, you know, I six, two, when I played shrinking now, but six, two, then with a pair of skates on making me like six, five and all those nasty New York fans, all of a sudden got very quiet when the, the, the fan, the fans were, it was like the parting of the red sea. Just, just nobody coming near me, nobody going around me. Uh, and I got to where McNabb was and I, you know, the guy's leg was sticking up in the air and kind of flailing away a little bit. I grabbed his leg, just trying to settle it down. And he kept 
flailing and I just took off his shitty penny loafer and I sort of double pumped it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I, and I hit him once over the leg and, and the thigh. I mean, I didn't have him in the head. I didn't have him in the face. They actually did a study at a local university in Boston. They showed the tape one time to a group of students. And then they asked a series of questions, including where did Milbury hit the guy with a shoe? Many said the face, the head, you know, and, and, and how many times did he hit him? Three, four, but it was one little tap on his thigh. And then I eventually wound up throwing his shoe onto the ice, which is maybe the most egregious thing I did. That was it. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, we were in a time when there were just three news networks, we were the lead story. I mean, it was, it was the lead story. We were interviewed and pushed and pulled and condemned and suspended and that's it. And for 46 years, I've done a lot of things and, for, and I will always be remembered as the guy with the shoe. I'm curious, do you remember your hearing with John Ziegler? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, first the suspension came and then uh, we appealed the suspension uh, and we had a full board of governors meeting, John Ziegler pre presiding. Now, and, and we made our case that the fans had started this whole thing and, and uh, you know, we were just protecting ourselves and it was, we made a pretty good case, as I recall with our lawyers. And uh, it's tantamount to asking for Ziegler's resignation if they, if they were to overcome this thing. If they were to, if the appeal had held up, my understanding was that Ziegler would have been on really thin ice and probably would have had to resign. The vote, from what I know, and uh, I, that was Harry Sinden was, general manager and president at the time um, was extraordinarily close, but it failed. And uh, I remember him leaving that meeting, skipping down the hallway, literally skipping down the hallway, like the little twit that he was. And uh, he was happy with the outcome and that's he went Mr. home. Ziegler, not, that, that's Mr. Ziegler, not Mr. Sinden, right? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ziegler, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ziegler, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, that was an interesting time. Those guys ran a, an amazing circus, really. He was tight with Eagleson. Eagleson was tight mm -hmm. with Wurtz. It was, it, it was about as incestuous as you could get, but well, that's the well, way Of course, you were, you were part of, of uh, in many ways, uh, the removal of Alan Eagleson as executive director of the Players Association, and you were always one of the most vocal guys within the PA executive, correct? I, I, I was, um, and I was there when the WHA was in existence, and I, I had made a lot of money because of the WHA. Mm -hmm. My first contract, I made $35,000, and they were offering me a raise to like $45,000. The Whalers came in with an offer of $95,000, I think it was. And if they had said 100,000, you know, everybody has that magic number, I, I yeah. would have gone. And, and, and so they offered me a hundred, like 95,000. And I went, we went back to, to Harry and said, Hey, I got this from the whalers. And finally he came up to just shy of $70,000. And I was happy because it was my hometown, my, my hometown team. And, uh, but made me almost doubled my money because of the existence of the WHA. So now we go to 1979 and the league is about to absorb the WHA yeah. and they've made a deal with them. And my only take as the player rep at the meetings and Al, Al has, Al is president of the uh, executive director of the association. And he has an executive director board composed of like eight or 10 players and like seven or eight of them are his clients. Right. I mean, that's, that's incredible. It's incredible that this could happen then or now. But anyway, uh, we had several hard discussions. And I said, we cannot go into this thing making a deal unless we remove some of the shackles from our, our contracts that we, we can become free agents. I mean, really free agents. And at that time, it was like 35 you can become completely unrestricted. If you were 25 and your contract ended and you signed with another team, the, 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 
the payback was five first round draft picks. It was, it was insane. There was nobody was going to do that. And the team still had the right to match. So I went in saying, listen, we got to get, we got to get something here that gives us the right to move around at an earlier age or less restrictive. And uh, Al came back with a fistful of dollars, better insurance, better pension. There were some decent benefits to it, but it was nothing compared to what you could make in a, in a more free agent type world. Um, but so I lost that battle. And then um, I actually went back to the team and said, we can't do this anymore with this guy. And I said, I need your help. I mean, I want to, I want to pull the league, the players and find out if we should get a full-time executive director. Cause Al was doing all the agent work all the player director work and whatever else he was doing, stealing money by the ton from the, from, from Lloyd's of London, getting paid back there, which I guess we found out later, but, um, and I, the team all pitched in like a hundred bucks each. And I hired Price Waterhouse, the accounting firm to do a poll. Uh, do you want a full-time executive director? And should we hire a search? Should we, should we find a search committee to, to look for a new full-time director? And the poll came back surprisingly. It was like 50 to 60% response rate. And it came back positive. They wanted a full-time executive director. Uh, and they wanted, a, they wanted us to do it through a search committee, not Al appointing somebody on his own. I took it to the next player representative meetings. And Al, who was threatening to quit anyway, uh, then... Uh, announced that he didn't want, didn't want to quit. And then the board quickly gave him a new contract. It just happened just like that. It was, it was remarkable. And that's when I said, the jig is up. I can't do this anymore. And uh, I left the play representative stuff to somebody else, but he was, he deserved to be punished probably more than he was punished. He wasn't a great advocate for people who had serious disability issues. Uh, he, clearly did things on his own for himself and for his, his representatives and not for the good of the, of the league. I will say one last thing about this, that I do give him credit for having the balls to get the, the union started in the first place. With Mike Melbury. Um, I want to take you in a little di different direction. You have been around this game for a long time. And have 46 seen the, years. And you've seen the evolution of this, this game. And, um, you know, you played when fisticuffs were a regular occurrence, um, not necessarily players in the stands and getting six game suspensions, but this was a much more physical game. The idea of that incident that happened with you at, um, at Madison Square Garden happening today is unthinkable, really. Do you like where the game is now? Has the transition does it, did it bother you at one point and bother you less today? Where are you at on this, Michael? It's a good question. Uh, I know you're an anti-fight guy and I've become that. I've announced that uh, several years ago on NBC that I thought it was time to put that in the rear view mirror. Uh, and largely because uh, of the head trauma problem but also because, you know, the fact that we were still employing goons, guys that could barely play, it was just, it's kind of ludicrous, actually. And then we, it was time to grow up. And, uh, and I'm, it's pretty much gone now. It's, I mean, there's an odd fight here and there. And I think it's silly with face shields and helmets that, that people sure. are basically beating up their hand, their own hands instead of the opponent. But, but the, the outcry by Marlon Lemieux in the, in the early 90s, I guess, that got the game to change from the hooking and holding uh, of offensive players and slowing down of people on the forecheck made the game much more quick and, and, and much more dangerous. I mean, you can't get in the way of, if you're a defenseman and your partner's going back to get the puck, you can't get in the way of a forechecker or you're going to get whistled to the box. I think that's a mistake. I think that something's got to change there. I mean, the way we can pass the puck from zone to zone, almost, you know, two thirds of the ice, it's, it's a, 
it's opened it up to the fact that it's almost so fast that that when there is collisions and there aren't as many as there were although in the boston nashville game the other day there were 91 hits it was old-fashioned hockey but that's sort of a you know one out of 25 but it's it's fast the game is fast i like it fast but i i think there's some danger to it i think there should be some corrections made for you know the ability of of opponents to to get in the way of a four checker, some form or fashion, slow them down a little bit and, and prevent that sort of, I don't know, vulnerability of defensemen and, and the ability of four checkers to get in on, on the fly. I think that the changes that were made allowed the little man back in the game and the little man was skilled, now has a chance to succeed. I think that's a good thing. There are, think of the number of small players that you see in the game now, a guy like, Marshand and you know guy like Johnny Gaudreau or other players that that probably in the 70s and the 80s had no chance because they would have been squashed like bugs and uh, so I think all in all I, I enjoy it I, I watch it I think it's fun I think it's fast I think there's some things that could be changed but you know when I when I turn on the TV and when see Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl uh, I I, they've got my attention. I don't know what the hell's happening in Edmonton, but those two guys have my attention. I'm not sure they know at Edmonton either right now, but you, 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 would you put the red line back in to slow it down? I would consider it. I know Bobby Orr had, had oh, suggested that. And I, I think that's, you know, and doing that creates problems for people, but it, it actually enlist their skill you have to sort of pass the puck a few more times to get to the red line and it becomes more of a skill set I, I i would certainly consider it i would i think it's i think it's not a bad idea do defenses play differently now when the, with the two-line pass eliminated it's been so long but based on your observations do you play differently to prevent the long pass and if you brought the, the center line back into play that when it made the two line pass on offside, what would we see? Would we see something completely different than, um, I think we, I think we would, I, I and you can only know by trying it. And sure. That's why the American hockey league exists. You can try it at the American league, but when you see, and I have a, in my mind's eye, the vision of New Jersey or Tampa, when they have a lead and they're in the third period, they retract, right? They're going to retract. They're going to all pull back. And, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, I don't like it. I wish there was a way to employ man on man defense in our game. I don't think we can do it. I've thought about it a lot, but if you, if you had to be within a certain number of feet of a, of an opponent, I, I would like it better because that would, you know, that wouldn't, make for more one-on-one -on -one battles and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, skill sets that, that would define the game, but we're never going to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just too, it's too easy, but I don't, I don't like the fact that when you've got a lead and it's in the third period that, that everybody wants to go back in a one, two, two sort of alignment that, that smacks to me of where Jacques Lemaire was coaching with the New Jersey devils. And uh, it's effective. It's very effective, but oh, it's, it's boring. It's very boring. I, rem <laughs> I remember uh, a game that when Guy Boucher was coaching Tampa and Peter Laviolette was coaching Philadelphia. Oh, remember that? Yes. Yeah. Remember that, John? They were just, sure. they, Tampa wouldn't come up with it and Philadelphia wouldn't attack them. It was just, it was like just yeah. standing there back and forth and we were howling. And I thought it was a great move by Peter Laviolette and embarrassing really to Tampa, but that you can do that as a coach. That's the one the one thing coaches, they get in the way because they think they, they want to control the game. That's what coaches do. They, they don't, they want to control it in their own way. And players, you know, have to listen to their coaches. And when they get to this point, when you're controlling it in that fashion, it can be destructive. You, you, uh, you went to the Islanders for a while. What did you learn as a manager in this league? I mean, you, you talk, it's funny. You talked about being a player, a player rep. Uh, you went from one side to the dark side. You went to ownership. You went to management. What did you learn? You know, it was, 
it was stupid on my part to go to the Islanders. I was, I, I had been a successful coach for a little while in Boston. We've been to the Stanley cup finals and semifinals. And then I, I had a brief flirtation at Boston college and that didn't go so well. That's a whole different story, but I, I wound up being at ESPN and then, and then hired by the New York Islanders. And I didn't do enough research. The, the team was owned by the Pickett family, but John Pickett had been recently divorced and was really removed from running things. And he, he had sold 10% of the team to a group of four Long Island mega fans, for lack of a better phrase. And that was the group in charge. Don Maloney was the general manager and he hired me, but he was fired almost immediately after I got there. And they named me general manager and coach, which is the next worst decision I made. But I didn't realize how bad the situation was. Uh, when Don got fired and I was named general manager, they immediately told me that I needed to cut 25% of the payroll. So goodbye, Wendell Clark. Goodbye, Matthew Schneider. I mean, it wasn't a bad deal. We got a number one draft pick that turned out to be Roberto Luongo and Kenny Onsen, who was a hell of a defenseman for a long time. But that was a lot of pressure to be under. And then pretty soon thereafter, they sold the team to John Spano, who didn't have two nickels to rub together. I mean, they, I, he scammed $80 million from Fleet Bank. It was free money at the time. And, you know, <laughs> got to tell you, this story is, this is on the edge, this story. I'm at home, 9.30 at night, Garden City, Long Island. I got a call from John. And he said, you got to come meet me at the Garden City Hotel. Uh, that's pretty odd. So I get there and the Garden City Hotel is kind of like a nightclub lounge area. And he's sitting in one part of it with in the roped off area, of course, you know, big shot John Spano. Yeah. So I, I go over and sit down beside him, he ask me a few hockey questions. And then he says, OK, they'll be here in a little while. He said, who's going to be here in a little while? He said, the girls. First, they'll do each other, and then they'll do us. <laughs> Jesus oh, Christ. <laughs> I, I didn't take me long to sneak out through the kitchen, but I, I was, it was, that's where I was with ownership. And then, then came Gluckstern and Milstein, and those guys were bozos yeah. on the bus. It was just one after the other. And then and, and the two of the original owners wound up in jail. Uh, Gluckstern and Milstein should have been in jail, but, but then came Wong, Charles Wong and... Right. Sanjay Kumar, Sanjay winds up in jail for 13 years and Charles takes over and Charles is involved in every aspect of the business. So right from the get go, I learned, I guess, to answer your question in a roundabout way, I, re I learned that the, the new way of being an owner was to be totally hands on. I had a deal for, for Jason Allison from Boston. We needed to center Peter Lavio at Newham because he had been there. And it was a big deal. And, and we had a high first round draft pick we we're going to have to give up amongst other assets. And it was all set to go. And I called Charles to tell him the deal was done. And our part of the deal also included Dave Scatchard, who was a third slash fourth line player. And he said, you can't make that trade. And I said, why? And he said, because Dave Scatchard's our kind of guy. He visits sick kids in hospitals. He's the kind of guy we want on our team. And mm -hmm. around the table, there was this, we were in Florida for the draft. And, and, and this is when it was going down. The entire, the entire scouting staff, pro and amateur was there and they were privy to the conversation. It was just, it was un unbelievable. And so at that point in my life, I said, screw it. I, I, I don't care if I win a Stanley cup, I'm going to protect my job. We traded for Alexi Yashin. We traded for Michael Pekka. And I worked for a whole bunch more years. We didn't come close to a Stanley Cup, but I got paid. Well, we have barely scratched the surface here, but unfortunately, we do have time limitations on this podcast because <laughs> uh, it's also on Sirius XM. Um, I, I hope we can bother you somewhere down the road and uh, ask you to come back and continue the conversation. Uh, I know John and I both have enjoyed it very much. It was great of you to take time for us today. We want to thank you very much, and hopefully we'll have a chance to chat again. Yeah, glad to see you guys both back in action. Well, thank you very you much. You too. You too, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mike. All right, have a good one, fellas.
Mike Milbury. We'll come back and wrap it after this. Well, our thanks to Mike Milbury for uh, being with us, and I and I hope he he decides uh, to honor us with his presence again because um, I he's, he's a great storyteller. Well, we we I mean, I don't normally make notes, but uh, we we didn't even scratch the surface. No, we didn't even scratch the surface about his life, you know, because he's I tell you what, and I think you get a sense of it uh, in listening to the show. Mike is a polarizing guy and you either like Mike or you can't stand him. If you ask Islander fans about Mike Milbury, there's not many people that think he's, he was a good manager, but there's lots of people uh, in Boston that still love him. Well, look at, I kind of sat on the fence. There were things that Milbury did over the course of his career that raised a spocky and eyebrow for me, but I'm being perfectly honest uh, when I, um, with what I said, the, the sentence that he used on the air that got him fired from NBC, that was absurd. It was, it wasn't, it was not a fireable offense. Bob. It, it was, was not, not fire, it was not a fireable offense. I, you know, I think it's, it was innocuous enough that I'm not even sure it deserved any kind of slap on the wrist, but to be dismissed. And then the effects of that, clearly impacted on his ability to get a job with either TNT or ESPN is, I don't know what the phrase is, frustrating at least. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's one that uh, Mike lives in. The great thing is, is that Mike is transparent enough to be able to talk about it. Well, uh, when you're talking to the producer, tell him uh, at least this host would like to see him come back at some point in time <laughs> and continue the dialogue. I'm, gl I'm glad. Uh, we will uh, find something else to address uh, tomorrow. We hope you'll join us uh, for that, whether it's on the podcast or on uh, Sirius XM channel 167. For John Shannon, Bob McCowan, goodbye, everybody.